he was a real Rosicrucian, and long story short, every day or every couple days, he would write me a message. But that morning, I would get a dream about the exact message that he would tell me about. So it's almost like a dual form lesson. You know, one in the morning in the form of a dream, and then later on in the day through the actual email at the time. I found that pretty interesting. So, and then eventually we parted ways. But as far as I could tell, he was a real deal. He was psychic. He knew things about me that, I mean, I, I never even wrote about, you know, nothing salacious, but just, just personal spiritual mission type things. So yeah, that, that was my introduction to <laughs> that phenomenon. And I've met other psychics in my life who were able to read my mind or influence me in ways. Now, as far as dream influencing goes, that's a big topic because yes, you know, it's common knowledge that entities can influence dreams, whether it's nightmares or inducing inspiring dreams. And this is something that goes back to far ancient times to the Greeks and the Egyptians. Welcome back. I'm here with Tom Montauk. Tom, welcome. Hey, good to be here. All right, Tom. So I think John Strader and I think Rich Geldrich highly recommended you. And I've looked at your website and some of your materials, and you've been kind of covering a wide variety of topics for a very long time. So you really know, you really know what you're doing. So I appreciate that. So for the audience, if you could just give folks a very high level background of yourself, where you're coming from. I think you and I are both by training electrical engineers, mm, but uh, anyway, I, I don't want to steal your thunder. Just very brief background of where you're coming from, what you do and your background. Okay. Yeah. So I was born in Germany. My dad was an electrical engineer. My mom, she was from Singapore. So she had like a Asian culture background. So she believed in paranormal activity. My dad, he was into parapsychology. So I started out with that foundation, which was non-religious, but they allowed me to explore reality and to believe in what I wanted to. But my dad had many discussions with me about science and engineering and the way the world works. So I was incredibly curious as a kid. But at the same time, I also had a lot of paranormal experiences back then with alien abductions. So I am an alien abductee, although I don't really allow it to define my personality. But it did get me interested in researching the UFO subject when I was an early teen. So I spent most of my teen years reading and studying everything I could about the subject. And then I went into physics and electrical engineering in college in order to figure out how UFO technology worked and how to apply it for the benefit of humanity. So around that time is also when I started my website, eventually became Montauk.net. And I have communicated with about 30,000 people at this point, networked with just tons of people, experiencers, scientists, other abduction researchers. So I've been in the field for over 20 years and I've connected a lot of dots and I've tried to put it all together to come up with a pretty workable theory about what reality is, who we are, what these beings are, and what their agenda ultimately is. All right, before we get into the main topic, which is dreams and dream influencing, mm -hmm. when you say you think you have a good sense of what these beings or who these beings are, without not getting into too much going too deep, a high level, what's your, what are your current thoughts on this topic? Well, high level. So, first of all, they are quasi-physical, meaning that they are not strictly extraterrestrial in the sense of being purely physical beings like we are traveling here from other planets in physical spaceships. That isn't the case. It's almost like they can retreat or occupy sort of a, a, a meta, a meta reality that isn't quite the realm of the astral realm or the afterlife or the spirit realm where these spiritual phenomena come from, but it's not also the physical world that we are at. It's actually something in between, something more liminal. And because the English language doesn't have a term for it, that's why a lot of people get confused wanting to put them in one bin or the other, even though they don't fit in either. And yet they also have a foot in both worlds. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? 
tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. So from that premise, we start realizing that they have abilities that we can't simply, we can't conceptualize it within our cultural, religious, or uh, scientific framework. And if we try to, then we end up force-fitting a fourth-dimensional, essentially, phenomenon into a three-dimensional box. And so, you know, there's a lot of, it's like the, the whole story of the three men and the elephant they're all blind and they touch different parts of the elephant well mm -hmm. that's what religion science and popular culture is or even ufology they're all touching different aspects of it and they interpret it in their own way but it ends up creating conflict because none of them are getting the full picture so i try to adopt more essentially thinking fourth dimensionally in a way not fourth necessarily geometrically dimensionally like according to mathematics but more in the sense that they have a degree of freedom that we as physical beings within 3d linear time don't have okay so that's like the overview and as far as the motivations we can get into that more but just to put it succinctly they, they seem to have ultimately in the end yes a spiritual occult agenda and there are different factions you know some seem to be more benevolent but the majority do seem to be predatory and because they're predatory what does a predator do well a predator wants resources whether it's energy food territory safety, protection, whatever, slaves. Uh, so a lot of them are predatory in that sense. But it's not simply resources in the sense of minerals or water, although they do take that stuff too, but also life force energy itself. And the reason why I say that is because there have been many abduction accounts where abductees are terrorized in sham ways, where the medical procedures that are done on them actually don't have a point. So it's almost like a charade. And there are entities standing around that seem to be feeding off the emanating terror energy from these abductees. Now, I'm not saying that every abduction is this, but it has been reported often enough in my research and the people that I've talked to that I do think that there is an energy harvesting component to it, which ties into a lot of other subjects like Robert Monroe and his research or his writings on the Lush farm theory that Earth is actually an energy farm for these beings which interestingly enough does correlate with some abduction accounts. And it also correlates with the field of psychic vampirism within occultism, where people learn how to siphon the energy off people around them, pets, neighbors, loved ones, family, you know, coworkers. And they do this intentionally to siphon their life force energy. And they themselves then become, they need less sleep, they need less food, they're just more alive. But it comes at the expense of all these other people getting more tired, more sickly, you know, less capable of being who they truly should be in life. So, it seems like no matter what field that I look at, this idea of energy harvesting or life force harvesting, or even in physics, I guess you could call it entropy harvesting. Even that, I mean, it shows up all over the place, right? So I do think that that's one aspect of why we are dealing with these entities. You know, maybe they do see Earth as a kind of farm for themselves, whether it's just for biological resources or breeding a new hybrid species to use as, I don't know, colonizers of other worlds, you know, turning us into their colonizers, imperialist, you know, second like imperialistic agenda, and as well as like energy harvesting and so on, right? So it's a multi-spectral phenomenon, but their agenda isn't, as I said, strictly 3D physical. So there is an occult spiritual component to it, but at the same time, they're not 100% spiritual and metaphysical, like let's say ghosts are or angels or guardian spirits or something like that, right? So it's something in between, and that's what people need to really focus on, you know, just the idea that they're not strictly physical, but not also strictly metaphysical. They're in this in-between quasi-physical state. Are you familiar with Jerry Merzinski? Yeah, yeah, I am. I've seen many of his interviews where he does talk about demonic entities operating through some of the patients that he's been around. Is that what you're and, referring to? And, yeah, and when you're talking about every time when he interviews patients or when he interviewed patients, and they would have these episodes, they would always feel exhausted afterwards. Mm -hmm. So right. that was one of his f theories, is that they were feeding on the negative energy that they generated. Exactly. So we see that in occult cases. So for example, that's a really good example. And there's, it's great because there are so many people that work in the, in the mental health care field who have exposure to people like that, people who are under the shadowing or possession of non-physical dark beings that a lot of people would call them demons, 
because they do act like the demons of Christianity. However, Christianity doesn't have, a, let's say, a, a trademark on the demonic phenomena. See, because right. the demonic phenomena shows up in many other cultures going back thousands of years, just under different names. So demons, whatever you want to call them, they are real. Whatever, I mean, you yeah, know, whatever. Yeah. It could be a number of different things. Right. The negative gin. I mean, I forget all the terms like the Watiko idea, Wetiko idea that the Native Americans have. The same thing, essentially. It's also called Wendigo. But yeah, so it shows up in different fields. And also in the case of like haunted houses, you might have one of these dark entities setting up shop in your home. To advertise on Thrill Glass Darkly, email thrillglassdarklyads at gmail.com. And typically what they do is they saturate the entire space in your home with their own toxic dark energy field in order to make it more comfortable for them to roam around and kind of operate within that space. Okay, so when you walk into one of these homes, you can immediately feel like this oppressive, dark, kind of ugh, icky energy in there. And the people that live there, it's, I mean, it's essentially the same as living in a home with lots of black mold in the walls where you're always exposed to these toxins, except for in this case, these are non-physical, energetic, etheric toxins, essentially. And so the people that live there, they, they become more sick, more tired, more fatigued because they're exposed to this stuff. And the entity is feeding off their life force energy during the day, especially at night when they're sleeping, the entity kind of comes around and hovers over their body and kind of like jacks into them and starts feeding off their energy, including inducing nightmares. Interesting. All right. Well, that's a great segue into this dream influencing realm. Are there people in the population, or is it everybody possesses this to some degree, that they can influence dreams? And the reason I raise this is I've heard, heard an apocryphal story. Don't know if it's true. Don't know if it's real. I can't really claim it. But apparently back in the 80s, Soviet operatives were using these techniques to spy on people that they thought were associated with the U.S. remote viewing program, like Robert Monroe, who wasn't affiliated with it. He was just running his, you know, out-of-body operation in Virginia at the Monroe Institute. But nonetheless, they he was, you know, may have been targeted. Is this ability something that's commonplace is it rare is it even real if you kind of talk a little bit about that okay so you're talking about one human being influencing the dreams of another correct is that mature correct. right okay so i have a personal story about that and so many many years ago i was contacted by someone who was part of the rosicrucians like the real the real deal rosicrucians and like Jacques okay. Vallée, like Jacques Vallée kind of Rosicrucians. Yeah, but but even even beyond that, more like the okay. see, because there's different kinds of Rosicrucians. There's ones where you can buy a membership and you get the monthly pamphlets that you study. It's like a home study course, right? That's not that's more like the I don't want to say wannabes because that's kind of pejorative, but they emulate themselves after the real ones. So anyway, yeah. So he was a real Rosicrucian, and long story short, every day or every couple of days, he would write me a message. But that morning. I would get a dream about the exact message that he would tell me about. So it's almost like a dual form lesson, you know, one in the morning in the form of a dream, and then later on in the day through the actual email at the time. I found that pretty interesting. So, and then eventually we parted ways. But as far as I could tell, he was a real deal. He was psychic. He knew things about me that, I mean, I I'd, I'd never even wrote about, you know, nothing salacious, but just, just personal spiritual mission type things. So, yeah, that, that was my introduction to <laughs> that phenomenon. And I've met other psychics in my life who were able to read my mind or influence me in ways. Now, as far as dream influencing goes, that's a big topic because, yes, you know, it's common knowledge that entities can influence dreams, whether it's nightmares or inducing inspiring dreams. And this is something that goes back to far ancient times to the Greeks and the Egyptians. You know, they always believed that there were higher beings that were sending dreams into their heads and sometimes giving prophecies or advice or, you know, just things like that, right? But as far as humans go, in order for, it's, it is my understanding that in order for one human to influence another, they have to have some degree of psychic development, whether they know it or not. See, a lot of people, well, not a lot, it's actually a small minority, they're born with natural psychic talents. And, and the way that that works is, see... So, 
we are obviously we're not just physical beings we have a soul we have a spirit we have a higher non-physical component but the thing is most of the time our body and our brain is locked into that in like a very narrow channel where we operate through the physical body but this higher component of us does not operate necessarily outside the physical body in the sense of bypassing the brain and the biology and everything right so it's kind of like locked into this form and so therefore we don't really influence too much about reality or other people if we don't have this higher field expanding beyond the confines of the physical body but if you have a person who has a very active aura or a very active energy field that actually goes beyond the physical body then it can actually project you know whether locally or even non-locally perhaps even into the future or the past as remote viewers and remote influencers claim then you can have this energy field that can actually go beyond as i said the confines of the body and therefore affect another person's mind another person's biology even okay so if one person can influence the dreams of another they can do it either through this projected energy field or through their higher consciousness which is already non-local and kind of doing this back channel linkage between the other person's non-local consciousness which is also outside of 3d physicality so i think there's different avenues they can do it you know so they can do it through this space and time or they can do it outside of space and time but as i said it's a small minority so most people don't have it so if you do have the ability then you know consider yourself rare yeah well i don't know if i do or not but it, it's hmm. um like i said i've been experimenting with it and it's yeah, you know, it, it sometimes yields well, often yields results. Okay, and then what sorts? Of, do you think this is a mil, there are military application? Well, there's certainly military applications. Right. But do you think the military is doing this? I think so. I've heard different abductee, well, military abductee accounts where they were used for this purpose, where they were used almost as like those those arrays of radio satellite dishes that astronomers use to probe the universe. So you take like 10 or 100 of these radio dishes and you combine all their signals to create like one giant thing. So consider the idea that you might have, let's say, 10 or 100 military abductees who are all being remotely plugged into at night while they're sleeping. And they all have, you know, a relatively innate psychic gift. And that's maybe one reason why they were chosen for this task. And they can all be arrayed together to serve as one giant psychic receiving or influencing antenna. And so I've known military abductees who found themselves waking up in that state where they were being used to remote view a target or to remote influence a target, for example. So, you know, if you can combine multiple ones, then it's almost like you've got your own bespoke remote viewing team out in the population, right? They don't even have to come to your underground military base in order to do this. They can be in their own homes, but just being remotely influenced through. So when you say military abductees, can you define that really quickly? Yeah, so military abductee, it's like the concept of an alien abductee, except for instead of being taken by aliens, you're being taken by literally military personnel into an underground military base. Now, these aren't like army bases or navy bases or air force bases. They're not necessarily that. They're several levers or layers deeper than that. I mean, both literal, literally and figuratively, in the sense that we're talking about like a dark shadow military the, the deepest black ops, like gray, gray programs, these non-governmental organizations that do contract work for the government, you know, which is therefore outside the whole sphere of government oversight. Okay. So that, that whole entire sphere, I mean, there's a lot of sh shady things going on in that realm, things that are decades, if not centuries ahead in technology of even what we would call congressionally budgeted black programs which might only have to do with like, oh, some, some advanced bomber with advanced radar stealth capability. Like that's like, that's small potatoes compared to these other groups that are, you know, as I said, in these deep underground military bases and very often working with, they've been seen working with alien beings, whether those are real alien beings or as Stephen Greer claims, you know, these programmable life forms that are artificially created by these deep underground military groups. But either way, They've been seen working side by side with non-human beings and these abductees therefore a lot of times military abductees are also alien abductees either separately or together through the same joint projects okay so these people are military abductees they're taken they're altered in some way and then they're just used basically as amplifiers that's one of the applications because I mean, there's other cases where they're not used as for psychic purposes, but for uh, more shady things like basically sex trafficking. There, there's a 
oh, I forgot her name, but but she was, I think she was an Air Force, or maybe a National Guard woman who, she's a military abductee, and she claims that she was taken even to an off-world base, off-world human military base, to be used for sexual reasons. And there's that, and then there's also for for the men. I mean, some of them claim that they are, you know, let's say super soldiers used for assassination purposes or some future time after societal collapse where they'll be used as, as I don't know, like physical force on the surface to either protect or to propagate the agenda of some of these dark groups. And some of that stuff, you know, you can you can discount it as just fantasy or live action role playing. But some of it does have enough evidence, in my opinion, to to take it seriously. So I do think that there's something going on in that sphere. Okay, now, how does someone determine if they have this ability? To influence dreams, right? Well, the only way to really do that is to experiment with it. So you have to coordinate with the person that you're trying to influence. Ideally, well, see, so here's the thing. I mean, if you tell them ahead of time, then I guess in a way you are contaminating the experiment. Unless you don't tell them what you're going to project, and you just say that you're going to do it, and please report back what you experience, then that's it's the more objective. That's the yeah. way I've done it. Right, and that's pretty much the only way that you can do it. So, yeah, right, so you just do that enough times, and then eventually it becomes so improbable that you just have to conclude that you're definitely having an effect. Okay, and why do you say it's very rare? Just in my experience, because and in order to do this, I believe that you do have to have some degree of psychic ability. And so there, if you can do that, then you should also be able to do other things in regular life, like... For example, just everyday examples of just very weak telepathy, for example. So if someone, let's say, I don't know, it keeps having a consistent pattern where they're thinking something and then someone else around them brings it up, like maybe they're thinking of a particular food or smell or memory or something like that, and the other person says, oh man, I just got this craving for whatever, and it happens to be the exact same, very obscure thing. And if this happens to many different people around them, then obviously they have the ability to influence others. And some people might have this ability, but not really know that they have it. They just find it curious that these people are saying what's on their minds. So that's one example, right? So I don't think that the ability to influence another person's dreams, I don't think that that's isolated to just that application. I do think that it would show up in other ways. So if a person has it in other ways, then I think that that would be the case. So me and speaking to a lot of people, I would say that most people do have just low psychic abilities, which colloquially we would just call that intuition they might just have a good intuition because intuition is like low level psychic ability because if you cranked up intuition like 10 times more then maybe you would actually start getting detailed information from whatever you're picking up on right instead of just like a, a general gut feeling so i mean even animals have psychic abilities to some degree even more so than a lot of people i would say because a lot of people i think are just too distracted with the human world, with the grind, with 3D living, the news, social media, right? There's too much noise going on in the head versus an animal, which is more clear, more simple. So animals can pick up a lot more than humans can. And so for a person to do it, if they don't have the ability already and they want to develop it, they have to also develop the ability to be able to focus their mind, to silence their mind, to kind of concentrate on the thing they're trying to project. And even with that, I mean, What's that one study saying that a certain percentage of the population doesn't even have an inner monologue, like an inner voice? That That is fascinating to me that people can't. And there's some people apparently also who can't see three, like who can't like see and rotate three degree or, you know, three 3D images in their minds. Yeah. Like that's yeah. That's amazed me. Right. And, you know, perhaps in some cases it is merely some neurological issue, some anatomical brain issue, but from an occult theory in occult theory, there are non-physical layers to the human being, the astral body, the etheric body, and other non-physical components. And there could be also misconfigurations or something missing in there as well that could lead to this lack of ability. All right. So when you're looking at some of these abilities, you talked about animals being... You're, there are a lot of... I'm, I mean, I'm not going to call them up. There's been a lot of synchronicities in this interview so far. So you said sometimes animals can be more psychic than people. Mm -hmm. Is there the way that animals behave around a person? Does that, can that indicate some, I mean, I'll just give you a personal example. And people who follow the show have seen this a million times. But an owl lands on your back gate. You're able to walk up to the owl within five feet. The owl doesn't fly away, doesn't scare, but just stays there 
allows you to take thousand photos of it, some video too. And this is like a big great horned owl. Is that normal or is that is <laughs> that is there something to that interaction that may be different? Now, I'm not saying it wasn't an owl, it was an owl, right? Because I have pictures. Mm -hmm. But is there something related to psychic phenomena or is that just a chance encounter could easily be explained away? Yeah, well, you know, owls have always been associated in various cultures with occult phenomena, with higher beings, non-human beings, I mean, even going back to ancient Babylonian, Sumerian times. And I've known people, I, I mean, look, I, I've had my own strange owl experiences. My girlfriend has had also owl experiences. I knew a woman who she went camping with, I think, with her boyfriend, and they had what seemed like a, a UFO or alien presence. Because there's some, you know, some weird occult signs or not occult signs, but paranormal activity going on. And then a strange white owl just shows up and lands on a tree really close by and is watching him. And it, it scared him. But it coincided with other strange things going on in that exact time, that, that exact uh, time period, right? So there's a, a weir really weird connection between paranormal phenomena, even alien phenomena and owls. Because, I mean, owls are also used as common screen memories, as you know, for gray alien abductions. Right. So for, for, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows what screen memories are, but just real quick, it's when you get abducted, you experience things during the abduction. And then when your memories get wiped afterwards, because your memories don't get wiped 100%, they impose an additional memory on top of that, that sort of resembles it, but deviates it onto something more plausible. So you remember a gray face, but that gets wiped. So now you remember an owl's face. You remember an owl standing outside your window last night, looking at you with his big, scary eyes right so that's a screen memory but when we talk about your example of encountering did, was it did you say one owl or multiple owls it was one owl that at that time yeah so even even so i mean that is an improbability because owls can be kind of skittish and so they don't just sit there waiting for you to take pictures of them now as far as the explanation goes on that i mean there's multiple possibilities one is that it was just strictly synchronistic it was strictly a symbolic, you know, just like in dreams, you have dream symbols. Well, this is waking life, but you have a dream symbol in waking life of an owl indicating something, maybe uh, that you have some spiritual phenomena going on in your life or something's watching you or, or a message from a higher realm or something like that, right? That's a synchronistic element. And, you know, some Native Americans, some people would interpret it as a symbolic synchronistic sign like that, like an omen or, a, you know, just like a sign. So you have that. Then you have the other possibility where owls are i mean animals in general are but owls and cats in particular they are interfaceable by other entities they're able to be used as vessels or like remote avatars or probes by non-physical entities or maybe even psychic entities i mean i can't rule out i mean not that anyone's ever really brought this up but that a remote viewer could put his consciousness into the mind of let's say a bird and then fly the bird around and observe things through the bird's eyes. I mean, maybe that's possible. But I'm just saying that there's other beings that can operate through animals. I got a story about that that I'll tell you, but finish okay. what you're saying and then... <laughs> okay. Yeah, interesting, right? So you can have that possibility. And then the third possibility is that, well, the screen memory one, but obviously that's not the case with you because you had pictures of it. Yeah, so just, again, I always accept that it could just be luck whatever but i tried another experiment where i just you know went, went, went out in my backyard sat down and just imagined a raven in the local area and imagined that raven flying from his perch and kind of with a guided image of kind of like a google maps version of where my house was and then just kind of opened my eyes. And about five minutes later, I heard a squawking. And there was a raven just, you know, on a branch, just right outside my property, <laughs> just squawking at me. And then, of course, as soon as I kind of noticed, you know, turned to notice and walk over toward it, it flew away. Again, could be complete, random. I tried it on another occasion, nothing happened. So... And I'm not saying I flew it there. I, it, the intent I had was more, I'm going to find a local raven and guide him to my house. And again, I fully acknowledge it could just be random coincidence. Mm -hmm. But that's what happened.
Yeah, that's interesting because yeah, my girlfriend we we used to have a we used to have a black cat named Kitty, and she was very intelligent and very almost human in a way, but she was also quite psychic. So our cat responded to a lot of the paranormal phenomena that we had, whether it was some demonic entity that was around, some ghost type being or aliens. I mean, one time in Virginia, we had an alien being outside of our house going from window to window to window, like kind of like going back and forth. And our cat was tracking it, you know, from window to window, like going to absolutely nuts. Like she never responded that way to any other wild animal or person you know it's almost like she sensed that oh crap what the hell is this i've never encountered this before and so she was doing that um but yeah but getting getting back to it i think in the case of the raven for example i mean we do also have to consider the possibility that it is the mind over reality phenomenon where just through your subconscious wishes or projections you can actually influence probability to pull something into your life okay so perhaps that's what it was. Perhaps it was you actually. It's actually very quantum mechanical. It's a, mm -hmm. like a quantum mechanical view of reality, right? Yeah, totally. Because in quantum mechanics, as you know, you have wave functions. Like everything is this amorphous cloud of possibilities, and the observer is what collapses it into one single tangent or tangible reality. But the thing that physics never really asks is because they're not psychologists. They don't ask, well, what part of the observer is doing it? Is it their conscious mind? Their subconscious? Their super ego, whatever you want to call it. There's different parts of our psyche. And I, I do believe personally that it is the subconscious that is shaping the wave function. And then it is the conscious mind, the ego, that focuses it down into one tangible reality. So it's actually both working in tandem that influence probabilities, right? So if you are in a sleepy state or just kind of relaxing, you're dropping down into an alpha brainwave state. And in this alpha brainwave state, you are no longer as focused within the ego conscious mind. And you're starting to sink more and more down into contact with the subconscious. And because the subconscious seems to be the part of us that can affect reality around us probabilistically the most, then therefore you're able to influence reality more if you get into this relaxed state of mind. Or, you know, even in sleep or in that in-between twilight state between waking and sleeping, that is one of the best states to be in if you want to experiment with manipulating probability. Yeah, and again, it could just be pure coincidence. I, I mean, I've run other experiments too where I would ask about an outcome and I would just say a prayer, right? And I would say, if this outcome show me a hawk, if that outcome, show me a raven. And on one such occasion, within five minutes of that prayer, a raven flew 20 feet over my head, visibly squawking at me. And that outcome eventually happened. It came to be. So again, if I had to like assess the probability of that outcome at that time, I would have assessed it at 60 to 70%. So it's not all that amazing, but the synchronicity like the synchronicity of the and not even synchronicity but the timing between the act and the result were highly correlated it doesn't mean it caused it it doesn't mean and that's what's so difficult about this field is a lot of this stuff works in or appears to work i'm being trying to be very careful with my words appears to work inconsistently like it's not that general you're not going to get the type of empiricism that you would get from the standard scientific method sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't so you can't really establish a consistency that would be enough to be rigorous enough for the scientific method yeah we'll see so because i've got a scientific background and you've got electrical engineering we both know that the scientific method is it's rigid or it's not even the scientific method because that's merely a method of innovative discovery and iteration of ideas, right? What, what a lot of people nowadays think is the scientific method is actually materialistic, right. positiv positivism. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of academia and what we think is a scientific method nowadays, it originated from the 1800s when there was a culture of materialism, Darwinianism. No, ever. I mean, it was the most mechanistic time in our culture ever, you know, mm -hmm. and th this was pre quantum physics. So nowadays, the skeptical attitude that academia has towards paranormal phenomena, it originated from that time period before quantum physics. So it hasn't even been updated to what quantum physics has discovered, or what it has implied. So that's why when nowadays we have these paranormal occult phenomena, alien phenomena, and they say, well, what is the scientific proof? Like, it is not scientific, you're not being rigorous enough. Well, the people that say that, they're holding to standards that predate quantum physics, that are outdated by this point. 
it has to be updated. See, because even in quantum physics, right, there is this uncertainty principle, which is that the more you know one quantity, the less you know of the other. And that happens also within this field where the, the more significant, the more improbable, the more wow factor something is, the less reproducible it is. And the more reproducible it is, the less significant it is. And so that's why scientists like Dean Radin, for example, who wants to prove consciousness and paranormal phenomena using scientific experiments, he has to use a lot of people, a lot of trials, a lot of experiments to get the weakest signal to prove something. Because he's dealing with a lot of, you know, he's dealing with something that, that can be rigorous, that can be shown to a lot of people. So therefore, the phenomena kind of backs off and it manifests very weakly. Whereas if you have just one person in their home privately, not able necessarily to share the proof, then the phenomena can be going at them 100%. And there's no doubt in their minds that it's real. So there's a strange trade-off between being able to prove something to everyone on Earth, but it being sort of uh, ambiguous, or something being just mind-blowing, but you can't really share it. Now, luckily, in your case, you got the picture of the owl. However, that still leaves room for doubt. And that's why I think it was able to happen is because people can still say, oh, it was just a coincidence. It was just an animal versus if you had gotten a picture of a gray alien, then there'd be even less doubt, right? But because it was an owl, it happened, right. but you're able to take a picture. So it's, it's strange how it happens. And just because it is like that doesn't mean that it's not real or it's not scientific. It just means that science is at fault for not updating itself to expand into this realm of post quantum physics. All right. So another question about dreams. And we talked about military applications. Can it be used to harm people? I think so. And actually, as you're saying that, that movie Dreamscape from the 1980s came to mind. Have you ever seen Dreamscape? Yeah, with, um, why am I not remembering his, well, his name? Well, yeah, yeah, Dennis Quaid and the other guy, Dennis I forget Quaid. his name. Yeah, the, the other guy. Yet. Yeah, yeah, and the other guy who looks like Sean Penn, but isn't Sean Penn. Yeah, so... So that movie, they were using dreams to assassinate people, to give people heart attacks, like politicians. So it's like a mil secret military program to attack, you know, the adversaries of America. So that's what that movie was about. And I think that's a great, that's a great, I haven't seen that movie in a while. There's another movie that came out kind of in the late 90s or early 2000s called The Cell, which mm, was yeah. similar. I think mm -hmm. Jennifer Lopez had to go back and or go into a, like a child's dreams and they were like horrific. Yeah, sort of dreams. But yeah, I need to go rewatch Dreamscape because it's been many years since I've seen that. Yeah, and sometimes movies are as you as people have suspected, they they're used to put out ideas that are otherwise classified that you couldn't put out there due to non-disclosure agreements, you know, national security issues. So they put it into into fictional form. Yeah, so I think that's one of those movies. So there probably has have been secret government programs or military programs to use dreams to harm people. Now, dream to harm someone. Well, you can traumatize them psychologically. You can probably induce a heart attack in someone who is susceptible to that just by giving them the utmost heart-stopping nightmare, right? Or I suppose you could use it in a hypnotic manner, the same way that hypnotists install post hypnotic commands you know if you can get into someone's dreams you could probably do that i mean you could you could distract one part of their mind with a visual in the dream and then the other part is actually speaking almost subliminally to their subconscious and then who knows like the next day or the next week they might get triggered by something and do something that they normally wouldn't do so there's different avenues for influencing someone for sure yeah speaking of dreams this morning i had i don't even know how to interpret this I mean, I think there might be a way to interpret this, but I'm not gonna say it here because there's a lot of there's a lot of weird stuff going on in the background, not with me, but through kind of whisper networks and, and things like that. But in this dream, I was looking out the window of my childhood home. It was kind of late afternoon, and there was like a black dog. Uh, have you ever seen like? traditional pictures of Cerberus, mm -hmm. right? The three-headed dog. It looked it was like that kind of dog. Just but it was like this big black whatever kind of dog it is. It's got like kind of the roundish face, kind of not quite a British bulldog, but that kind of face. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was struggling with something that at first on first pass looked like a moose, right, with that kind of those those kind of off white horns, but it kind of morphed more into if if you could make like a stegosaurus mm. into a mammal, 
and instead of having like those flaky ridges it was just kind of like this these horned ridges these two animals were struggling with each other and the dog was kind of get starting to, you know get starting to get the upper upper hand and rather than watch it from a distance i walked out into the backyard around this pool that we had and into these sheds and as soon as i kind of got into the shed the door was already open and the dog kind of had come over to me and you know i quickly tried to close the door it wouldn't close entirely but the dog had just stopped and was just kind of i couldn't hear growling but its teeth were bared like and the message seemed to be go away like let me do what i'm doing mm -hmm. and just this is not this is not for you go away and you know i quickly kind of just closed the door and as it was slowly opening back up on the hinge and i kind of just used the you know the the blind spot of that dog to kind of creep out and get out of the and get out of the area and ran back inside and the dream was over hmm. and i think right now when i talk about whisper networks there are people who may have this ability around the world who have been getting attacked and some of the things that these people may have been doing they shouldn't have been doing and the people attacking them may have a right to be attacking them and that's the vibe i got from this dream yeah interesting i i don't know i don't know what that means but mm -hmm. It was yeah. Weird. Well, see, the interesting thing about dreams is that they give us the choice of what level to interpret it as, whether we think of it as being merely personal, like, let's say, different parts of our own psyche that are in conflict. OK, that's how that's how the, the psychoanalysts would analyze that dream. But also we know from occult phenomena and remote viewing and remote influencing that it could be other things as well, whether it is actual people, one person being your protector, another one being an attacker. Or maybe it's your own higher self or spirit, whatever you want to call it, that's protecting you from an external psychic attack. Or it could be even non-human beings, you know, some sort of astral entities, one acting as a guardian and another one being of a more demonic or dark persuasion that's trying to get at you. And then it's trying to take care of the problem and you yourself don't need to get involved. However, you are psychically witnessing an occult battle happening around you over, over your life. Yeah, so anyway, I have no idea how to interpret it, but mm -hmm. th that was kind of my interpretation. There was two kind of outside forces, and one was just rip, you know, got the upper hand. And the one that had the upper hand probably deserved to have the upper hand, if yeah. that makes sense. But still, there's some darkness to it, right? Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, it was just like, this is not your fight. If you get, if you try to get involved, you're going to get mauled too. Yeah. But I don't want to maul you. Right. Yeah, no. Right. And it's been my experience and many people that I've known who they, in, even in well, just waking life, so not even dreams, they experience a, a very negative improbability that tries to harm them. Like, let's say uh, something taking hold of the car and trying to steer it into an, the, an oncoming car, trying to kill them, essentially. And then another equally improbable, almost miraculous thing intervenes to correct it, to counter it. So it's almost like this weird, invisible battle happening between two forces that you can't even see. One trying to knock you off and the other one trying to keep you from being knocked off because maybe it's not your time yet or it's not within your destiny or your sort of chosen path, you know? So I think there are dynamics that are happening in the background around us in our lives that we normally only see the end effects of, whether, you know, I mean, because sometimes, for all you know, you might have died, let's say yesterday, on the road, but things were corrected, and so therefore you have no idea that you were saved. You're alive today thanks to something that you don't even know. I mean, it's possible. You can't really prove it one way or the other, but I'm just saying it's possible if there are things that are intervening, whether it is on the level of these quasi-physical forces, or if it goes beyond that into the realm of occult, synchronistic, spiritual phenomena. Yeah, and you, you raise, like, synchronistic things that i mean with me it happens constantly that stuff happens mm -hmm. constantly it's not it's barely worth remarking right so yeah. you know as an example do you know who alan greenfield is 
Yeah, yeah, I do now. Mm -hmm. So when I was interviewing him, I mentioned the Al story just randomly. And he's like, funny you mentioned that. He's like, I've never really seen an owl until 12 hours ago. Hmm. And, and and this, I don't think this was in the interview, but this is kind of off or may, it may, may have been, I can't, I can't remember. So after that interview, 12 hours before an interview I had with Peter Lavenda, I saw an owl and I, you know, again, of course I was able to videotape it and get pictures of it and all that to prove it. So, hmm. and I just put it at the beginning of the episode, but there's like, Stuff like that happens to me all the time. Hmm. Before I interviewed Chris Bledsoe, that's when I first started seeing owls. The night before I interviewed him for the first time, they were flying over my house hmm. at low level. And then when I was finishing reading his book that night, there was an there was an owl in a in hundred percent great horned owl because I like hmm. I know what the the hooting sounds like, and it kept hooting until i finished the book and as soon as i finished the book it stopped hmm. but that stuff happens routinely to me and again it could you know it could be i'm just looking for it and i just notice it more but it's fairly routine so much that i don't really talk about this kind of stuff yeah well synchronicity so, is a good subject it is yeah let's, let's see how much uh, we're doing on time let's put a pin into that in that and kind of start with that in the next episode any final words on dreams and dream influencing well i would want to say that if you want to end, if you want to understand dreams i think it helps to understand it from a more occult perspective not just a neuropsychological perspective because i've noticed myself that if i am going to sleep and if i just suddenly open my eyes i find myself actually outside my body just very slightly i'm actually obe i'm out of body and as I return to waking consciousness, I can see my point of view sliding back down my face and locking with my physical eyes. So it's almost like I'm looking through non-physical eyes when I'm entering sleep. So when you're asleep, you're most likely partially out of body, okay? And so therefore, you can't just rely on biology and neurology to understand dreams because there are other things happening at an energetic, occult, esoteric level. So therefore, literature on that, whether it's the theosophical material or Rudolf Steiner's material, it helps to understand the different layers of the being, how they operate, and therefore what dreams actually are and how they could be. And then that opens the doorway to understanding how one person can influence the dreams of another. Okay. Yeah, and I that's one thing I've been trying to do my entire life and I've never been able to do is OBE. I've been, you know, I've been trying it since I was mm -hmm. maybe 12 years old. Yeah, well, you know, um, the only... Yeah, the only real way to do it is to make your body fully 100% fall asleep, like sleep paralysis. But the problem is, in order to do that, it's very easy to yourself, your own mind, drop into sleep. And so therefore, you just enter sleep like normal, right? But then if you try to keep your mind awake, sometimes, well, most of the time, your body doesn't want to go to sleep. So you never go deep enough to ever reach that state of sleep paralysis where your body's buzzing and melting and vibrating and so on. So if you, if you ever want to like, try it, I think the best way to do it is to fall asleep, set an alarm, and when the alarm goes off, you wake up very briefly, you kind of like try to hold yourself still, and then because you already were asleep just now, your body's ready to fall asleep. So at that point, go ahead and keep your mind aware, and just kind of relax and breathe naturally, relax all your muscles, and now your body has that inertia to want to go back into sleep. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, it'll fall asleep faster than your mind does, and then you might be able to notice the process of detaching from your body and entering either out-of-body state or a lucid dream state, one of the two. All right. Well, thank you, Tom. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to speaking with you in the next episode. Sure thing. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe, and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything.
third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you could get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel, and I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that, and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates Club. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of a expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site. And there's also, you can go through YouTube with either a Super Chat, Super Sticker, or a Super Thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.